It's the Daily Dispatch in discussion with Darren Mann. Load shedding, it's a word which has entered the South African lexicon since about 2008 when it first became a reality in this country. On and off since then, how long do we have to deal with this? What are the reasons? Will we ever get past it? We thought we'd find out from an expert today if he could have answers to those questions for us. His name is Bertie LaRue. He was an electrical engineer at ESCOM, lectured at Border Tech as it was then. He also uh, has a government ticket to check out big wind turbine plants. And of course, he'll be doing power audits and customized designs off-grid and uh, basically consultancy work as well. Bertie, thank you for joining us. That's a pleasure, man. So let's get to the first one. What caused the load shedding problem? Was it aging infrastructure or more to it? Um, yeah, well, I started the business as... as in about about 15 years ago because in 2007 we started running out of electricity mm. and you know then working in Eskom you obviously were, were close to the action and you knew <laughs> things were changing you know yeah yeah so that's why I left in and opened up a alternate power solutions business um, and I, you know I, I'm not a politician so I think I can tell the truth please the, the, the moves, political moves by, by government in those days was basically led to competent people receiving or difficult to refuse uh, separation packages and whatever. Right. Um, so a lot of the competent people were at to leave or left Eskom because they got such good packages offered. Sure. Um, and that was obviously a political a, a political thing, you know. Uh-huh. That, that's about all I can really say about the, the causes for that. Okay, so it wasn't aging infrastructure, which we're often told is a reason not not aging infrastructure at that stage. I don't, I don't think it, it ever has been because you know the, all your all your engineering infrastructure, any moving parts require maintenance, and I believe that the, one of the main reasons is that regular maintenance hasn't been done. Other reasons, as a man who was at the coalface, so to speak, at the time, that you can think of? Well, there, there was no planning being done for because you know, you've obviously got a certain growth rate, and normally electricity consumption is pretty proportional to the GDP. Hmm. And so we could see that, you know, well, we would know that the, the country's going to run out of electricity because of the, the, the growth rate, but without building new power stations and, and maintaining the existing ones. How do we prevent this from going on in the future? What can be done now? What I started was a, a business that does alternative power. Right. Um, and just interestingly enough, the very first house that I took off the grid was in 2007, completely off the grid, and they haven't gone without one minute of, without electricity since then. Is it cost effective? Um, the prices that house in those days, which was quite a lot, cost three hundred thousand. But you know, as wealthy wealthy people in those days, or in all days, the guy had the, the foresight of what's going to happen. So you know, the, and as wealthy people normally do, they plan ahead and and they're capable of doing that. Sure. But the, the prices have, have have gone down considerably. The, the, the photovoltaic panels, that one consists of photovoltaic panels, battery backup, good inverter, etc. And the, the price in the game of, of, of renewable electricity, um, the, the PV panels cost me as a redistributor 49 rand per watt. They rated in per watt of, of panels. So it's 49 rand per watt, and typically a 300 watt panel. So it's 300 times 50. Um, now those same panels, the, the guys are selling, or the, generally speaking, the guys can sell those same panels for about ten rand or what. So that's a significant decrease yeah. in those costs. The, the, the only drawback is the is the actual backup power because to take a house completely off the grid, you need backup batteries, and obviously the cost of the batteries is is, is now the, high, the higher cost. Okay. As, you know, they, they link to the metal price and what have you. So consumers can opt to go off the grid. What can ESCOM do at a time like this to sort out the load shedding issues? Can they do anything? Um, I, 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 
can't see a short-term solution to it unless they perhaps start subsidizing like they did with the solar water heating projects, subsidizing installations like that, to just to save the country's GDP in some way. And Bertie, what do you think of the idea of uh, private energy producing companies entering the market? Well, I was, uh, as you mentioned, I, I worked as, a, as what we call a GMR2 at a, at a wind farm. It's, it's, it is free energy. You know, so it does, it does, you used to see that in play, but, you know, the, the renewable is limited in some ways. And I, I shouldn't be saying that, but because the salesman wouldn't like me about that, but the renewable can work while the sun's out and and the wind's blowing, you know, in, in that case. Sure. Otherwise, you need to, to go in, in a big way into nuclear, which is which is now obviously like a swear word, but nuclear for the country would, would be probably the answer. But in terms of an ESCOM monopoly, won't that translate into something better for the consumer if ESCOM's monopoly were to be broken? Private energy producing companies can enter the market, but then of course we also do have, we do run the risk of those private energy companies forming a cartel and basically yeah. manipulating the price. Yeah, look, look that's one of the... the Problems with capitalism, I suppose, or challenges with capitalism. But um, private private companies would be able to, would be able to contain the load shedding definitely, definitely to an extent, like you know, like like the wind farms and 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 PV farms. And if you want to see renewable as um, nuclear is renewable, then that as well in in what they call a PBMR or pebble bed modular reactor system. If I might focus on something other than the technical aspects, labour yeah. disputes often seem to result in, in load shedding. That was offered as one of the reasons for the latest round of load shedding, which has gone as far as stage six. Yeah, well, see, again, that's politics. I, uh, I don't know too much about, uh, about that, um, how much it is actually. Uh, firstly, I didn't know that people in those positions are allowed to go on strike because they, they should be regarded as essential services. You know, you've got hospitals, etc., that are suffering with the load shedding because of that. Basically, the message to consumers is you're going to have to put up with this for the foreseeable future. Well, like I mentioned, it can't be done in a hurry. You know, the, 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 as an as a individual, you need to, I think we need to sort of toughen up and, and look after our, all, our own energy consumption. We're chatting with Bertie LaRue, former electrical engineer at ESCOM, lecturer at Border Tech, and these days he consults for alternative energy sources. Thanks so much for joining us on the Daily Dispatch in discussion today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. That was the Daily Dispatch in discussion with Darren Mann.